Hi there, I'm Ray, and a really warm welcome or welcome back to my channel. I love to read and here are the top five books that I read in 2022. Interestingly, these books are not necessarily ones which I rated five stars at the time. Uh, I just looked back over the year and picked the top five books which stood out to me at the end of the year. And I think the thing which is particularly special about these reads is not only that I really enjoyed them or found them gripping or well written etc at the time, but they, they have really stayed with me and kind of beautified and enriched my experience of being alive, which for me is what I look for in the very best of books. In no particular order, the first book which I adored last year is the second book in the Earthsea series by Ursula K. Le Guin, and that is The Tombs of Atuan. This was a really interesting read, which actually took me ages to get into. It tells the story of a young girl who is part of a kind of religious sect in the world that this is set in. Uh, and she is chosen at a very young age because she's believed to be the reincarnation of the leader. And it looks at her life growing up in this quite weird, very isolated religious world. Uh, it's a book which is as much for children as it is for adults. So it follows her journey through growing up within this community to her coming of age and the part of the story that really began to grip me and where I found there were some fascinating ideas is when a wizard who we recognise as a character from the first book, although I, the second book is totally standalone, really you don't need to have read the first book at all in order to get everything that you want to get out of the second book. Um, he becomes illegally trapped in the tombs of Atuan. And we have this really quietly beautiful story about trust, about friendship, about the complexities of freedom and the needs of the human spirit. Next is a book that I read with Kate Howell's Kindred Spirits Book Club, which I really enjoyed participating in last year. And this is a book called The Girl of the Limber Lost by Jean Stratton Porter. It's one of those books that I would just never have discovered had it not been for Kate and her recommendation of it. It's a really sweet, fun, coming of age story that follows a young girl called Elnora living with her awful mother in a swampy area of the United States and is written in a style which is very similar I think to Eva Ibbotson, Laura Wood, if you enjoy those kind of YA romances then this is for you. But it was also published um, in the early 1900s so if you also like Edwardian literature then it's even more so a book that I think you'll enjoy. It tells the story of this girl's time at college, of her relationships uh, with various people around her, her family, her romantic relationships, and she has a real passion for <laughs> randomly moths and hunting for moths in the local swamp area. It was a really interesting take on natural history. It was definitely came from a time where catching and preserving moths was seen as a positive thing to do for the environment, which is, you know, probably questionable now, but it was really interesting from a historical perspective from that point of view, and I just really enjoyed it. I loved the characters, I loved the plot, and it was one of those books that you didn't want to end and which was quite enriching through having numerous parts to it. It wasn't just a very simple story, it felt like there were different phases of Elnora's life that we followed and I really enjoyed all the different phases for different reasons. Then we have another book that I would never have picked up had it not been for booktube and that is Pony by RJ Palacio. This, I know <laughs> this is a bad reason to pick up a book and also a bad reason to not pick up a book but I would never have considered it because of the cover um, and also the synopsis was that there's a young boy and his father gets taken away by some mysterious horseman in the middle of the night and that sounded like something which was fairly creepy um, and which I wouldn't enjoy. However, I didn't find it creepy at all. It's a really interesting story set around the time of the US Civil War and it does follow this young boy and his quest to find his father who gets taken away. Um, and this boy can see ghosts and it's very much a book about the 
the thin veil which exists between the physical world and the spiritual world and in a completely uncreepy way how some people seem to be able to interact with that and it forms a part of their lives whereas that is not the case for others. It was a fascinating take on children's invisible friends and it was a fascinating look at love which lasts beyond death and at, like I say, this thin line between the world which we can see and the world which we can't see which I always find a fascinating theme in books. Alongside that it was just a really gripping kind of wild western feel story I guess. Um, so yeah the plot was really gripping. There was loads of fascinating historical information in there about scientific developments of the time, about early photography, stuff like that. And yeah it was just a really rich, interesting and quite unusual book which I'm very glad that I discovered thanks to Middle Grade March last year. Next up we have an adult non-fiction book and this is Divine Beauty by John O'Donoghue which you can also get as an audio version and I think it's called Beauty the Invisible Embrace. These two books are basically the exact same book but it feels like one of them is a redraft of the other one. I think O'Donoghue read the book for radio at some point. This is the version you can get on Audible and I could not recommend the audio version highly enough. John O'Donoghue was an Irish poet and his voice is beautiful and the subject matter of this book is also incredibly beautiful. It's such an enriching experience to hear him reading it and this was a book which profoundly affected me. John O'Donoghue was an Irish poet and Catholic priest who also drew very heavily on the traditions of Irish Celtic spirituality. So those are the kind of influences of his writing. It features O'Donoghue's meditations on beauty basically, it's kind of like a collection of mini essays meditating on beauty and the role of beauty in our lives, how important it is, how to seek it out, how to enrich our lives with greater beauty and the way in which this ties into a spiritual experience of being human. I was so moved by it, I was so enriched by it. I felt like it really beautified my life to spend time with his mind and with his words. I ended up having a reading from the book at my wedding last year, which I will share with you now so you can get a sense of kind of, of what the book is because it's quite hard to describe and also of whether the writing style really resonates with you the way that it certainly does for me. One of the amazing things about loving somebody is that you can never get used to their face and when you look at them again and again you'll always see something new that you hadn't glimpsed before. Beauty always resembles a beginning. Each face is its own landscape and is quietly vibrant with the invisible textures of memory, story, dream, gift, need and possibility. And when the face illuminates, we see the beauty of the soul in which it dwells. And we also feel beautiful when we are loved. This is one of the secret hungers of the heart is to find love, because in love we come to know and believe and trust in our own beauty. And really, sometime in every life, every person should hear the sentence said to them, you are beautiful. Because this is not a cliche or a platitude, but at its deeper level, it's a recognition and invocation of the dignity, grandeur and grace of their spirit. Beauty shines with a light from beyond itself and love is the name of that light. Then lastly, my top book of the year, probably tied with John O'Donoghue to be honest, but just a very different reading experience because this is fiction, is The Rainbow by D.H. Lawrence. I have always adored Lawrence but hadn't read any of his work for a period of time and coming back to his work through reading The Rainbow was a very special experience for me. In fact, I did record a non-spoilery vlog of my reading experience, which I will link wherever that little eye is up above if you're interested in finding out more and seeing my reaction to the book as I read it. 
In summary, The Rainbow is a story of three generations of one family living in Nottinghamshire from the 1840s up to the early 1900s and it tracks their experiences in life and especially in love and the way that industrialization and modernization of society alters this incredibly innate human experience. To me, Lawrence is just pure insight into the human condition and I feel like he writes my soul on the page. I feel like reading him reveals parts of myself to me that I hadn't seen before and that is why I find, I found The Rainbow an, an utter masterpiece and it's why I love his writing so much. So those are my top five. I do have a few quick honourable mentions if you would like some extra content. These are books which I gave five stars to but which for a variety of reasons just didn't leap out to me as my absolute top five of the year when I was reflecting over everything that I read last year. Uh, the first of these is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. I read this with a group of booktubers last year. I had such a wonderful time reading and discussing it. It's the story of Shakespeare's son's death and it really has an incredibly strong sense of time and place to begin with and looks at motherhood and grief in a profoundly moving way. It was an immersive experience to read and I thought it was flawless. Uh, I think the reason it didn't make my top five is that I don't know whether I would necessarily want to go back and reread it. Next up I have a book which was a reread and I haven't included rereads in here because I did reread a few books last year which were five star reads which I knew that I loved and I knew would be five star reads. Uh, however I do quickly want to mention this one because I don't think I've talked about it much if at all on this channel and that was my reread of Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder. This series was probably my favourite series of books in my childhood, or definitely up there, and I've been really anxious to reread any of them because I've heard that they really haven't aged well, and it's always a bit nerve wracking to go back to a favourite childhood book with the fear that you won't like it again. However, I found this book so comforting and so nostalgic. It's the story of Laura, who lives in a cabin in Wisconsin with her ma, her pa, her elder sister Mary and baby Carrie. I think Laura is only about four or so in the book and it follows a year of their life living really remotely in the woods and you just get such a strong sense of this being a time period and way of living that is lost to modern society. Um, it's incredibly based on survival, on hunting, on that kind of thing and we see all of this through child Laura's eyes, we see the wonder and the magic of it. I also listened to this on audiobook and they had somebody playing Pa's fiddle which the music that Pa plays is a really central part of all of the stories throughout this series and it really helped bring it to life having somebody actually playing the fiddle and singing the songs in the book. I thought that was a really lovely addition and I'm planning on rereading the rest of the series over time by listening to these audiobooks. And then lastly a quick shout out to Fields of Home by Marita Conlon McKenna. This was the third book in a trilogy of books called Children of the Famine. Uh, I read the first two in 2021 and then finished the trilogy in 2022 with this book and the five stars is really kind of representative of the whole trilogy. It's just such a well done example of children's historical fiction. It follows these three children through the Irish potato famine and beyond into their late teenage and early adult lives. I just thought this was a textbook example of how this kind of book should be written for children. The stories were really gripping, there was loads of historical information that I learnt from them without ever feeling like it wasn't a story. Uh, I really cared about the characters, I was gripped throughout, they cover a real range of historical experiences within the books. For example, the second one is about one of the children emigrating to America, the final one looks at um, the old country houses in Ireland and lives of the serving staff within those houses as well as farmers um, and sort of the control of the state over the houses that people lived in. It just, it covers a vast 
array of historical events which I didn't really know anything about beforehand in a wonderful, child-friendly, really gripping way. So that was my last quick shout out of a wonderful book that I read last year. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. And I would love to hear in the comments what your favorite book or books were that you read last year. I'm always on the lookout for more wonderful things to read. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you're doing well and I will see you next week in another video. Bye bye.